the enduring legacy of the Church Fathers and early Christian writers. Introduction In the gentle folds of history, woven between the seams of ancient manuscripts and the whispered echoes of sacred halls, there lies a golden thread, a lineage of wisdom, courage and spirit that has shaped the tapestry of Christianity. This book is an odyssey, a journey through time that will unravel the lives of 30 remarkable individuals, the Church Fathers and early Christian writers, whose voices have transcended the ages to reach us even today. As we traverse the centuries from the dawn of the Apostolic Age to the flowering of Byzantine theology, we will encounter sages and scholars, poets and preachers, each a beacon in the lineage of faith. Their stories are not mere chronicles of dates and doctrines, but vibrant narratives of passion and purpose, of flesh and blood men who grappled with the divine, the human, and the mystery that bridges the two. Imagine the bustling streets of ancient Rome, the austere deserts of Egypt, the fragrant gardens of Antioch, and the grandeur of Constantinople. In these places, our protagonists wrestled with the profound questions of their time, forging paths of belief that millions would follow. Through their eyes, we will witness the growth of a faith that was once a fledgling set of beliefs, maturing amidst trials and triumphs into a force that would reshape the world. This is not a text laden with jargon or a catalogue of abstract concepts. Instead, it is a collection of stories meant to inform, inspire and ignite the imagination of those on the cusp of adulthood, Stories that speak of human frailty and divine inspiration, of conflict and resolution, and of the eternal search for truth. Each life we explore is a testament to a unique journey of conviction, set against the backdrop of a world in constant flux. So, let us embark upon this voyage across time, from the echoes of the apostles to the shadows of the Ottoman power. Let us walk in the sandals of the early Christians, stand in the pulpits of the preachers, pour over the parchments of the scholars, and kneel in the cells of the monks. Through the lives of these thirty titans of early Christianity, we will discover not just the roots of a religion, but the human experience in its quest for the sacred. Welcome to The Enduring Legacy of the Church Fathers and Early Christian Writers, where history breathes, faith speaks, and the legacy of the past becomes the light for the future. Chapter 1. Clement of Rome, the Shepherd of Early Christianity In the twilight of the first century, as the nascent glow of Christianity slowly spread across the Roman Empire, there emerged a figure of serene authority and pastoral care, Clement of Rome. Often identified with the Clement mentioned by Paul in his letter to the Philippians, Clement's life is shrouded in the mist of early church history with only fragments of his story pieced together from the annals of Christian tradition. Clement, considered by many to be the third successor to St. Peter as Bishop of Rome, served as a bridge between the apostolic generation and the emerging Christian communities scattered throughout the empire. In an era marked by persecution and doctrinal uncertainty, his gentle hand steered the fledgling church through the roiling waters of external threat and internal strife. One of his most enduring contributions to Christian literature is the letter known as First Clement, traditionally attributed to him. Addressed to the church in Corinth, this epistle is a masterwork of pastoral concern, offering both reproof and instruction with the tender touch of a shepherd guiding his flock. It gives us insight into the early church's structure, emphasizing the importance of order, obedience, and the chain of succession from the apostles themselves. The letter is not just administrative but deeply spiritual, echoing with the lyrical beauty of a soul in love with God. Clement writes, Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ and see how precious that blood is to God, which, having been shed for our salvation, has set the grace of repentance before the whole world. Here, in the simplicity and depth of his words, we find the early seeds of Christian soteriology, the study of salvation. Clement's vision of Christian leadership was not about power, but service. He took seriously Jesus' words that whoever would be great must be a servant, and his own life reflected this. His work bolstered the concept of apostolic succession, which became a bedrock principle for the legitimacy and authority of episcopal governance in the church. Beyond First Clement, the details of his life are sparse and sometimes mingled with legend. 
One such tale recounts his exile by Emperor Trajan to the Crimean Peninsula, where he is said to have ministered to fellow prisoners and converted many to the faith. The story culminates in his martyrdom, a testament to his unshakable faith, as he was cast into the sea with an anchor around his neck. Through the veil of centuries, Clement of Rome remains a symbol of unity and continuity. His contributions lie not just in the doctrines he defended or the letters he penned, but in his example of humble leadership and steadfast commitment to the fledgling Christian community. As we delve into his legacy, we see in him the embodiment of the pastoral heart of the Church, a heart that beats with the rhythm of service and sacrifice, a timeless echo of the Good Shepherd himself. In Clement, we find not just an historical figure, but a companion for all who seek to live a life of faith in the footsteps of the Apostles. His story is our story, written in the ink of divine love and human perseverance. Thus, as we turn the pages of history back to a world where Christianity was still in its infancy, we rediscover in Clement of Rome the timeless essence of what it means to be a steward of the gospel. And so, our journey begins with Clement, the steadfast sentinel of the early church, whose life and words lay the foundation for the odyssey that is Christian faith. Through his eyes, we witness the birth pangs of a spiritual revolution that would transform the Roman Empire and ultimately the world. Chapter 2. Ignatius of Antioch. The Martyr's Flame of Faith. In the hallowed narrative of Christian history, the story of Ignatius of Antioch stands as a beacon of unyielding faith amidst the encroaching shadows of persecution. Born only a few decades after Jesus walked the earth, Ignatius became the Bishop of Antioch, one of the earliest and most influential centers of Christianity outside Jerusalem. Ignatius's episcopacy was cast in the tumultuous days of the early second century, when being a Christian was not a mere declaration of faith, but a defiance of death. His tenure as a bishop was marked by his fervent opposition to heretical teachings, particularly those diminishing the humanity or divinity of Jesus Christ. His unwavering stance on the unity of the Church and the authenticity of Christ's nature became a cornerstone of early orthodoxy. The journey for which Ignatius is most remembered is his final one, as a prisoner condemned to die in Rome. It was during this forced march to his martyrdom that Ignatius composed a series of letters that would crystallize his theological and pastoral insights. His correspondence with the Christian communities of Ephesus, Magnesia, Tralles, Rome, Philadelphia and Smyrna, along with a personal letter to Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, provides a window into the soul of a man facing death with unassailable hope. Ignatius's letters are infused with themes of unity, sacramentality and ecclesiology, he is the first known Christian writer to emphasize the phrase the Catholic Church, underlining the universality and unity of the Church across different locales. He writes, Wherever the bishop appears, there let the people be, as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. This identification of the local Church's unity with the bishop and the universal Church set a precedent for the organization and hierarchy within the Christian community. An interesting fact about Ignatius is his fervent advocacy for the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, a point he used to counter the Docetic heresy, which denied Jesus' real fleshly existence. Ignatius affirmed the Eucharist as the medicine of immortality, a profound expression of early Christian belief in the sacrament as a vital connection to the life and presence of Jesus. Ignatius's zeal for martyrdom is both startling and stirring, he saw in his impending death not defeat, but victory, a way to truly imitate Christ. He famously pleaded with the Roman Christians not to intervene, writing, I am the wheat of God and am ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. In Ignatius, we find the essence of the pastoral leader who is both theologian and martyr. His life and writing significantly shaped the Christian understanding of church order, sacramental theology, and the nature of martyrdom. He progressed Christianity not just by solidifying its teachings against heretical trends, but also by exemplifying the cost of discipleship in a world hostile to the message of the cross. His narrative is a testament to the transformative power of faith, a life that burned so brightly with the love of Christ that even in chains he illuminated the path for others to follow.
As Ignatius journeyed towards his mortal end in the Colosseum, he became a symbol of the eternal truth that in the economy of God, death is not an end, but a doorway to a deeper communion with the divine. And thus, in the annals of Christian tradition, the name of Ignatius of Antioch is etched, not with sorrow, but with the triumph of a man who embraced the flames of martyrdom as a final act of witness to the faith he so dearly cherished. Through his letters and his legacy, Ignatius continues to teach, inspire and challenge us, reminding us of the profound cost and joy of being called a Christian. Chapter 3. Polycarp of Smyrna, the Steadfast Witness. In the annals of early Christian history, the figure of Polycarp stands tall, a venerable bridge between the apostolic era and the patristic age. As the Bishop of Smyrna, a city that now lies within the borders of modern-day Turkey, Polycarp is remembered not only for his martyrdom, but for his pivotal role in the preservation and propagation of the apostolic faith. Born in the late first century, Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John, according to Irenaeus, who himself sat at the feet of Polycarp as a young man. This direct lineage to an apostle infused Polycarp's teachings with a profound sense of authority and authenticity. His life spanned a period when the eyewitnesses to the life of Christ were fading into memory, making his role in transmitting their teachings all the more crucial. Polycarp's tenure as a bishop was characterized by a pastoral heart and a resolute spirit in defense of the Christian faith against heretical influences, particularly those of Gnosticism and Marcionism. His contributions to Christianity were as much about what he stood against as what he stood for. He championed orthodoxy with a tireless commitment to the true gospel as taught by the apostles. His most famous work, The Letter to the Philippians, is a pastoral letter that offers insights into the early Christian community's concerns. Polycarp exhorted the Philippians to stand fast in the faith and to persevere in good works. His writing reverberates with echoes of the New Testament, indicative of a man who was not just versed in the scriptures, but whose life was steeped in them. An interesting fact about Polycarp is his journey to Rome to discuss the date of Easter with Pope Anicetus, which underscores his significance as a unifying figure in the early church. Though they did not agree on the issue, they maintained respect and communion, a testament to Polycarp's character and the mutual recognition of their episcopal offices. Perhaps the most defining moment of Polycarp's life came at its end. At the age of 86, he was arrested during a time of escalating Christian persecution. Brought into the arena, he was given a choice, swear by the fortune of Caesar and deny Christ, or face death. Polycarp's response is recorded for posterity. Eighty-six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Refusing to recant, Polycarp was burned at the stake, and when the flames failed to consume him, he was killed by a dagger. His martyrdom was not a defeat, but a resounding affirmation of his faith, a powerful testament that would inspire Christians for generations. Through his teaching, Polycarp helped shape the Christian faith, ensuring the apostolic tradition's continuity and the integrity of the gospel message. His willingness to die for his beliefs galvanized the early church, fortifying the faith of his contemporaries and those who would follow. In Polycarp, we find a storied legacy that reaches back to the apostles and stretches forward into the rich tapestry of Christian history. His life reminds us that the truths we hold dear are often forged in the fires of trial and sacrifice. As we remember Polycarp of Smyrna, we pay homage to a man who was not only a guardian of the faith, but who, through his death, became a symbol of the eternal life that faith in Christ promises. His story is one of unwavering conviction, a steadfast witness to the gospel that he lived, proclaimed, and ultimately died for. Chapter 4. Justin Martyr. The Philosopher's Defense of Faith. In the vibrant tapestry of early Christian thinkers, Justin Martyr emerges as a remarkable figure whose intellectual and spiritual journey reflects the dynamic encounter between the gospel and Greco-Roman culture. Born around 100 AD in Flavia Neapolis, in modern-day Nablus, Palestine, Justin would embark on a quest for truth that would lead him from the philosophies of the ancient world to the foot of the cross. His early life was steeped in the study of various philosophical schools, Stoicism, Aristotelianism, Pythagoreanism, and Platonism. Yet, in these systems of thought, 
Justin found no rest for his yearning soul. His conversion to Christianity, as recounted in his dialogue with Trifo, came after a chance encounter with an old man who directed his search for wisdom to the Hebrew prophets whose fulfillment was found in Christ. As a Christian, Justin continued to wear the cloak of a philosopher, signifying his belief that Christianity was the true philosophy. He opened a school in Rome where he taught this doctrine, arguing that the seeds of truth in pagan philosophy were but a precursor to the full revelation in Jesus. Justin's major works include the First Apology and the Second Apology, addressed to the Roman Emperor and the Senate, providing a spirited defense of Christianity against the misconceptions and slanders of the time. His apologies are treasure troves of early Christian thought, detailing the rituals of baptism and the Eucharist, the practice of worship, and the ethical principles guiding Christian life. What sets Justin apart is his approach to the defense of Christianity. He was an early practitioner of what would later be known as apologetics, presenting reasoned arguments to explain and justify the Christian faith. Justin argued that the Logos, a term used by Stoic and Middle Platonic philosophers, was fully embodied in Christ. For Justin, Jesus was the Logos Spermaticos, the seed of divine reason present in all humanity, making Christianity universally accessible. Justin's philosophical background also led him to engage with the idea of the seeds of the Logos, scattered among various cultures and philosophies, a concept that acknowledged elements of truth in pagan philosophies while asserting the fullness of truth in Christ. An interesting detail about Justin's work is his detailed description of early Christian worship and the Sunday assembly, which offers invaluable insights into the liturgical life of the second century church. His apologies thus serve not only as a defense, but also as a descriptive window into the lived experience of early Christians. His progression of Christianity was through reasoned engagement with the intellectual currents of his time, making the Christian faith intellectually respectable amidst a sea of skepticism. His arguments laid the groundwork for the development of Christian theology and apologetics, and his willingness to engage with non-Christian philosophies helped to communicate the gospel in terms that the broader Greco-Roman world could appreciate and understand. In the end, Justin's commitment to Christ would lead to his martyrdom around 165 AD. His steadfastness in the face of persecution, like the philosophers he once admired who remained true to their principles unto death, solidified his witness to the faith. Refusing to sacrifice to the pagan gods, Justin sealed his testimony with his blood and in so doing became Justin Martyr. Justin's legacy is one of a mind and heart fully given to the service of the gospel, defending the faith not with the sword, but with the pen and the power of reasoned discourse. His works continue to resonate, offering a compelling vision of Christianity as the true culmination of the philosophical quest for truth. As we explore his life and teachings, we discover in Justin Martyr an enduring example of the intellect in service to the heart's devotion, a harmony of reason and faith that continues to inspire believers to this day. Chapter 5. Irenaeus of Lyon, the Harvester of Orthodoxy In the landscape of early Christianity, Irenaeus of Lyon stands as a towering figure, a second-century theologian whose work would profoundly shape the Christian tradition. Born in Asia Minor, likely in Smyrna, around the year 130 AD, Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who in turn was a disciple of the Apostle John. This lineage provided Irenaeus with a direct connection to the apostolic teachings, a lineage that he would ardently defend throughout his life. Irenaeus's journey led him westward to Gaul, modern-day France, where he would eventually become the Bishop of Lyon. It was in this role that Irenaeus found himself confronting one of the most significant challenges to early Christian unity and orthodoxy, the rise of Gnostic beliefs, the Gnostics espoused a dualistic worldview, suggesting that the material world was the creation of a lesser, evil deity, and that salvation was accessible only through secret knowledge. His masterwork, Against Heresies, is a comprehensive refutation of Gnosticism and a positive exposition of Christian doctrine. In it, Irenaeus articulates the concept of the rule of faith, a precursor to the later creeds, summarizing the key beliefs of Christianity as handed down from the apostles. This rule of faith included the belief in one God, the Creator, the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Savior, and the work of the Holy Spirit through the Church. 
Irenaeus's contributions to Christian theology cannot be overstated. He was among the first to argue for the concept of apostolic succession to validate orthodox teaching. He maintained that the truth of the gospel was preserved through the continuous handing down of episcopal authority, beginning with the apostles and flowing down to the bishops of the church. An interesting aspect of Irenaeus's theology was his view of Christ's atoning work. He proposed the idea of recapitulation, asserting that Jesus recapitulated in his life all the stages of human existence, thereby redeeming them. He has therefore in his work of recapitulation summed up all things, both waging war against our enemy and crushing him who had at the beginning led us away captives in Adam, he wrote, emphasizing Christ's victory over sin and death. Irenaeus also held a deep conviction about the role of Mary, contrasting her obedience with Eve's disobedience, thus contributing to the early development of Mariology. Furthermore, his vision of the human person was notably positive. He envisioned the human being as created in the image of God, destined for growth and perfection through divine grace. His work in detailing the heresies of his time inadvertently provided future generations with a wealth of information about Gnostic beliefs, preserving their texts and doctrines so that they might be better understood and refuted by Christian apologists. By confronting Gnosticism, Irenaeus helped to secure the doctrinal foundations of the Christian faith. He laid the groundwork for the formation of the New Testament canon by advocating the authoritative status of the four Gospels. His emphasis on the unity of the Old and New Testaments as one continuous narrative of salvation history was pivotal in the Church's interpretation of Scripture. The impact of Irenaeus's work was far-reaching, not only in combating heresy, but in fostering a theological framework that supported the growing Christian identity across diverse communities. His approach was characterized by a pastoral sensitivity and a commitment to the truth that resonated deeply with the faithful. In the legacy of Irenaeus of Lyon, we find a synthesis of rigorous intellect, pastoral care, and unshakable conviction. His life's work was a harvest of orthodoxy that continues to nourish the Church, ensuring that the seeds planted by the Apostles would bear fruit in the lives of believers for millennia to come. Through his enduring efforts, Irenaeus assured that the apostolic proclamation would be preserved, allowing us to stand firm in the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Chapter 6. Tertullian, the Father of Latin Christianity In the twilight of the second century, as the young shoots of Christianity spread their roots deep into the Roman world, Tertullian emerged as a seminal figure in Carthage, North Africa. Born Quintus Septimius Florence Tertullianus around 155 AD, Tertullian's intellect and passion would carve a niche for Christianity within the Latin-speaking Western Roman Empire. His writings marked a departure from the predominantly Greek theological discourse, bringing to life the Latin theological vocabulary that would shape Western Christendom. Before embracing Christianity around 197 AD, Tertullian received a comprehensive education in rhetoric, law, and philosophy, tools he would wield with precision in his apologetic and polemical writings. As a convert, Tertullian brought to the Christian faith a fervor that was unrelenting, earning him the reputation of being both a staunch defender and a fiery critic within the church. Tertullian's legacy is multifaceted. He is often remembered for his scathing critiques of Roman pagan society, for his phrase, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church, underscoring the belief that martyrdom served to strengthen and expand Christianity. He is also known for coining the term Trinity, Latin Trinitas, to describe the Godhead, framing the doctrine that would become a cornerstone of Christian theology. In his numerous works, Tertullian covered a broad spectrum of issues, ranging from the defense of Christian beliefs against pagan accusations in Apologeticus to discussions on the nature of the soul, prayer and the Christian life. His Prescription Against Heretics laid down principles for maintaining orthodoxy, arguing that innovation was unnecessary and dangerous to the faith handed down by the apostles. Tertullian was not without controversy, however. Later in life, he aligned himself with the Montanist movement, a sect that emphasized the immediacy of the Holy Spirit's presence and prophecy, which brought him into conflict with mainstream Christian leadership. Despite this, his early works continued to be highly regarded by the Church. One of the most interesting facets of Tertullian's biography 
is his contribution to Christian ethics and morality. In De Spectaculus, he denounced Christian attendance at pagan games and theatres, asserting that such spectacles were diametrically opposed to Christian virtues. His call for a lifestyle befitting the followers of Christ challenged Christians to live counterculturally in a pagan society. His rhetoric was vigorous and sometimes severe. What indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? He famously questioned, signaling his disdain for mixing pagan philosophy with Christian teaching. Yet his own writings betray a nuanced grappling with the philosophical currents of his day, reflecting his belief that Christianity could fulfill the promise of philosophy, not by aligning with it, but by surpassing it. Tertullian's progress of Christianity is marked by his role in establishing a distinctly Latin Christian identity, creating a theological and philosophical vernacular that would endure throughout the centuries. His works provided a bedrock for subsequent theologians, such as St. Augustine, who would find in Tertullian's writings a source of inspiration and challenge. In the figure of Tertullian, we encounter a complex blend of fiery zeal and intellectual rigour. His enduring phrases continue to resonate in the Christian consciousness, and his development of theological language laid the groundwork for the Western Church's theological endeavours. His life and works remind us of the perennial tension between faith and culture, challenging each generation to articulate the timeless truths of the Gospel in the ever-changing contexts of their day. Through Tertullian, we witness the shaping of a faith that is as intellectually robust as it is fervently lived, a faith that seeks to capture both the mind and the heart in the service of God. Chapter 7 Clement of Alexandria, the educator of the faithful. In the dawning years of the third century, Clement of Alexandria rose as a guiding star in the firmament of early Christian scholarship. Born Titus Flavius Clemens around 150 AD, Clement would become the intellectual bridge between the Hellenistic world and the burgeoning Christian tradition. As a teacher and head of the catechetical school of Alexandria, he sought to educate and cultivate Christians who could hold their own in the philosophical conversations of the day. Clement's Alexandria was a melting pot of cultures and ideas, the perfect backdrop for a man whose life's work would be to reconcile faith and reason. His erudition was extensive, encompassing not just Christian sources, but also the breadth of pagan philosophy. Yet his aim was clear, to demonstrate the supremacy of Christian doctrine over all human wisdom. One of Clement's great contributions was his trilogy, the Protrepticus Exhortation, the Pedagogus Instructor, and the Stromata Miscellanies. In these works, he laid out a path for the Christian life that moved from conversion to disciplined living and finally to true knowledge or gnosis. Unlike the Gnostics for Clement, knowledge was not a secret to be hoarded, but a divine gift to be pursued through study, faith and moral living. Clement's concept of the true Gnostic was a Christian who, through love and philosophical understanding, had come to know God deeply. This was a knowledge not just of the mind but of the heart, leading to a transformative relationship with the divine. He famously said, The word of God became man so that you may learn from a man how to become a god. Interesting to his biography is Clement's attitude towards secular knowledge. He saw in the philosophy of the Greeks not an enemy but a preparation for the gospel, similar to how the law prepared the Hebrews for Christ. Philosophy, he wrote, has been given to the Greeks as their own kind of covenant, their foundation for the philosophy of Christ. The philosophy of the Greeks contains the basic elements of that genuine and perfect knowledge which is higher than human, even upon those spiritual objects. His work, Who is the Rich Man That Shall Be Saved, demonstrates his nuanced understanding of Scripture, where he interprets Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler as a call not necessarily to abandon wealth, but to abandon the will to wealth, thus allowing the wealthy to seek perfection in God. Clement's impact on Christianity was that of an enlightened teacher who believed in the power of education to deepen and enrich the Christian journey. His works provided a framework for understanding Christian doctrine in the context of the intellectual currents of the age, inviting a learned engagement with the faith. Despite his depth and influence, Clement's thought would be overshadowed in the West by the later dominance of Augustine, and in the East by his own pupil, Origen. Nevertheless, his approach to Christian learning laid a foundation for a tradition of Christian scholarship that valued both revelation 
and reason. In the end, the life and works of Clement of Alexandria speak to us of a faith that is not afraid to engage with the world of ideas, a faith that seeks to understand all things in the light of Christ. His legacy endures in the Church's ongoing mission to educate and form disciples who are not only believers but also thinkers, ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. Clement's vision of a learned Christianity invites us to a faith that is as intellectually alive as it is spiritually vibrant, a faith that seeks to know God ever more deeply as the source of all truth. Chapter 8 Origin the exegete extraordinaire. In the tapestry of early Christian intellectuals, Origin of Alexandria is a golden thread, weaving through the third century church with a mind as prolific as it was profound. Born around 185 AD into a Christian family, Origen would become one of antiquity's most brilliant theologians and an unrivaled biblical scholar whose exegesis laid foundational stones for the development of Christian thought. Origen's journey was marked by personal sacrifice. His father was martyred for his faith during the persecution under Emperor Septimius Severus, and legend tells us the young Origen desired to follow him in martyrdom, but was prevented by his mother's prudence. Instead, Origen devoted himself to a life of rigorous asceticism and intellectual pursuit, eventually succeeding Clement as the head of the catechetical school of Alexandria. He was a man of remarkable erudition and tireless labor, producing an estimated 2,000 treatises on a wide array of subjects. His seminal work, the Hexapla, was a monumental effort to compare the Hebrew text of the Old Testament with its Greek translations, a tool invaluable to the work of scriptural translation and interpretation. Origen's theological contributions were groundbreaking, though not without controversy. His speculative theology which included notions of the pre-existence of souls and the ultimate reconciliation of all created beings to God, would later fall under scrutiny. However, his allegorical interpretation of Scripture opened up dimensions of meaning that enriched Christian understanding of the biblical text. Origen believed that the Scriptures were a repository of divine mysteries, concealing deeper truths beneath their literal surface, which the spiritually mature believer could unearth through contemplative reading. One of Origen's enduring legacies is his concept of the Logos, the Divine Word, as a mediating principle between the transcendent God and the created world. His influence extended to his. Systematic exposition of Christian doctrine, particularly in works such as De Principis, on First Principles, where he explored the nature of God, the creation, the incarnation, and the ultimate restoration of all things. An interesting detail about Origen's life is his extensive travels, which underscore his role as a defender of the faith. He ventured from Egypt to Arabia, Palestine, and even to the imperial court in Rome, engaging in public debates and theological discourses. He corresponded with governors and philosophers alike, arguing the case for Christianity with both eloquence and intellectual rigor. One cannot discuss Origen without mentioning his extraordinary commitment to the text of Scripture. His exegetical methodology set a standard for biblical scholarship, blending literal, moral, and allegorical interpretations to plumb the depths of the sacred texts. His assertion that the sacred books are not of such a nature that only the bare words convey the meaning of the writers invited Christians to a participatory reading experience where divine revelation could speak anew to each heart and mind. Despite enduring torture during the Decian persecution, Origen's spirit remained unbroken, although his body succumbed to its wounds some years later, around 253 AD. He died far from his beloved Alexandria, yet his intellectual and spiritual influence continued to ripple through Christianity. Origen's work significantly progressed Christianity by providing the Church with a systematic theology and an intellectual framework for understanding the mysteries of faith, his dedication to the truth of Scripture and his pioneering hermeneutical principles would nourish the minds of believers for centuries. In Origen, we see the archetype of the Christian scholar, a person who sees in the study of Scripture and the pursuit of wisdom a path to the heart of God. His life challenges believers to seek a faith that is deeply rooted in the knowledge of the divine word, encouraging an ever deeper dive into the inexhaustible wellspring of truth contained within the Bible.
It is a call to approach Christianity not just as a religion to be practiced, but as a truth to be lived, loved, and understood. Chapter 9. Cyprian of Carthage, the Unifying Shepherd The mid-third century witnessed the rise of a leader whose influence would be felt not just in the region of North Africa, but across the Christian world. Thasius Cassilius Cyprianus, known to us as Cyprian of Carthage, was a figure of resilience, unity, and pastoral care during times of persecution and doctrinal discord. Before his conversion to Christianity in 246 AD, Cyprian enjoyed a successful career as a rhetorician and lawyer. His transformation from a life of affluence and social prominence to one of Christian service is a testament to the profound impact of the gospel message on individuals from all walks of life. As Cyprian himself said, when I was still lying in darkness and wandering in the night of this world, I thought it extremely difficult and hard to do what God's mercy was suggesting to me, that a man should be born again. His baptism marked the beginning of a remarkable journey in which he would become Bishop of Carthage only two years later. In this role, Cyprian faced numerous challenges, including the Novatian Schism, which questioned the readmission of lapsed Christians, those who had denied their faith under Roman persecution, back into the church. Cyprian held that the church, as a forgiving mother, had the authority to pardon and reconcile penitents, emphasizing the church's role in the restoration of the fallen. Cyprian was a prolific writer, and his letters provide a vivid picture of the issues facing the early church. His treatise, De Ecclesiae Catholica Unitate, on the unity of the Catholic Church, is a foundational text asserting the importance of church unity and the authority of bishops. He famously declared, he can no longer have God for his father, who has not the church for his mother. This principle laid down a marker for orthodox ecclesiology for centuries to come. His tenure was also marked by the devastating plague of Cyprian, which took a massive toll on the Roman Empire. Cyprian's response to the crisis was characterized by an active pastoral presence that provided care for the afflicted, including non-Christians, demonstrating the love and charity at the heart of Christian doctrine. This response not only brought relief to countless people, but also served as a witness to the truth of the Christian faith in action. The persecution of Christians under Emperor Valerian brought further trials. Cyprian's steadfastness in the face of oppression solidified his reputation as a leader of courage and conviction. His correspondence with Pope Stephen I regarding the rebaptism of heretics is another highlight of his leadership showing his commitment to the integrity of the sacraments and his ability to navigate complex theological issues. Cyprian's own martyrdom in 258 AD was a final act of witness to his flock. Facing execution, he encouraged his fellow believers with words of hope and faith. His reported last words, thanks be to God, reflect a life lived in grateful service to the divine. Interesting facts about Cyprian include his wealth, which he distributed among the poor after his conversion, and his insistence on clerical celibacy, a practice not yet widespread or mandated. His influence on Christianity was significant. He crystallized the notion of the church as a unified body politic, an idea that would influence discussions of ecclesiology well into the future. In Cyprian, we see the shepherd who guides his flock through both verdant meadows and dark valleys, embodying the unity and charity he preached. His life and work remind Christians that the Church is at once a divine institution and a human family, called to stand firm in faith, act in love, and always maintain the bond of unity amidst the trials of the world. Chapter 10. Ephraim the Syrian, the Harp of the Spirit. Nestled in the 4th century, amidst the early symphonies of Christian doctrine and spirituality, emerges a figure both poetic and profound, Ephraim the Syrian. Known for his lyrical theology and deep devotion, Ephraim's voice still echoes through time, offering a melodious glimpse into the soul of early Christianity. Born around 306 AD in Nisibis, within the bounds of modern-day Turkey, Ephraim was baptized as a young man and became a deacon in the early Syriac Christian community. He never sought priesthood, preferring to serve within his diaconal role, embodying the virtues of humility and service. Ephraim's life was a testament to the belief that humility raises to the heights and unites with God. An interesting aspect of Ephraim's life is that he lived through the tumult of his times, 
including the persecutions of Christians and the constant threat of invasion. When Nisibis fell to the Persians in 363 AD, Ephraim, along with many Christians, fled to Edessa. It was in this cultural and religious hub that he would spend the rest of his life teaching at the famous School of Edessa and writing the majority of his theological works. Ephraim's contributions to Christianity are immense, not only in theology but also in hymnography and poetry. His writings, composed in the Syriac dialect of Aramaic, exhibit a deep understanding of scripture and a robust engagement with the theological debates of his time, particularly countering the early heresies that threatened to fragment the young church. His hymns and poems were not mere reflections of theological thought. They were tools against heresy, teaching the local community the truths of the faith through song. One of Ephraim's most significant works is his commentary on the Diatessaron, a harmony of the four Gospels. His writings also include extensive biblical exegesis and sermons, as well as poetry and hymns that express a profound and intimate relationship with God. His hymns were sung in the liturgies and contributed to the development of the divine office in the Syriac Church. Ephraim's theology is marked by a rich use of symbolism and typology, drawing from the well of scripture to understand and explain the mysteries of faith. His hymns on the nativity provide a lush imagery of the incarnation, and his hymns on paradise offer a deeply poetic vision of the Christian hope for redemption and restoration. He often employed the metaphor of medicine to describe the work of Christ, saying, The healer came and dwelled in me. He took away my pains and my sicknesses fled from me. His legacy as a theologian is matched by his reputation for charity and asceticism. During a famine, Ephraim was known for organizing a relief program that distributed food and aid to the needy, his life thus was an embodiment of the Christian call to love one's neighbor as oneself. Ephraim's death, circa 373 AD, marked the end of a life lived in passionate service to God and his church. His title, Harp of the Spirit, beautifully encapsulates his role as a theologian and hymnographer, whose works would resonate throughout Christendom, earning him later recognition as a doctor of the church. Ephraim's legacy in Christianity is not merely found in the texts that survive him, but in the spirit of his approach to faith. A faith that sings, that seeks to understand the divine through the beauty of poetic expression, and that serves the world with compassionate action. His life and writings encourage the Christian believer to see in the world a living parable, filled with signs of the Creator's love, inviting each soul to respond in worship, in study, and in loving service. Chapter 11, Athanasius of Alexandria, Defining Orthodoxy In the dense and often tangled forest of early Christian theological disputes, one figure stands tall as a beacon of orthodoxy, Athanasius of Alexandria. His life was a relentless crusade for the truth of Christ's divinity, a truth he defended with unwavering conviction against the rising tides of Arianism, which denied the full divinity of Jesus Christ. Born around 296 AD in the bustling metropolis of Alexandria, a melting pot of cultures and ideas, Athanasius was steeped in both Christian teaching and the rigorous intellectual climate of his time. As a deacon under Bishop Alexander of Alexandria, he attended the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where he first emerged as a formidable opponent of the Arian heresy, affirming that Christ was of the same substance, homoousios, with the Father. Elevated to the episcopate as Bishop of Alexandria in 328 AD, Athanasius became the most visible champion of Nicene Orthodoxy. His tenure as bishop was marked by repeated exiles, five in total, as political and ecclesiastical powers often sided with the Arian controversy. Despite these upheavals, Athanasius remained the unshakable pillar of the true faith, once remarking, even if the faith were to collapse, it would recover in me. Athanasius's contributions to Christian doctrine cannot be overstated. His treatise, On the Incarnation, is a masterpiece of early Christian literature, laying out a clear and compelling case for Christ's divine nature and its necessity for the salvation of humankind. He wrote, He became what we are that he might make us what he is. His annual festal letters, announcing the date of Easter, also served to instruct the faithful on matters of doctrine and life. Through these letters and his other works, Athanasius shaped the Christian canon, 
by being one of the first to list the 27 books of the New Testament as we know them today. Interesting facts about Athanasius include his role in the development of Christian monasticism. His biography of Anthony the Great, The Life of Antony, became a bestseller of its time, igniting the monastic movement across the Christian world. It portrayed the monastic life as the pinnacle of Christian virtue and asceticism, inspiring countless Christians to seek holiness in the deserts of Egypt and beyond. Athanasius was a man of both intellect and action. His unwavering stand against Arianism was not simply a matter of theological debate, but was born of a deep pastoral concern. He understood that the nature of Christ was not a speculative matter, but one that had direct implications for the salvation and the daily lives of his flock. He was resolute that the truth of Christ's divinity must be preserved for the Church to remain the vessel of salvation. The legacy of Athanasius is enshrined in the creed that bears the name of the council he so ardently defended, the Nicene Creed, which remains a definitive statement of Christian faith to this day. His title, Athanasius Contra Mundum, Athanasius Against the World, epitomizes his solitary and sometimes lonely fight for the faith against overwhelming odds. Athanasius's death in 373 AD brought an end to a life that was a testament to the triumph of truth over heresy, clarity over confusion, and fidelity over convenience. For believers today, Athanasius stands as a reminder of the vital importance of doctrine, the power of resilience in the face of opposition, and the profound understanding that in the person of Christ, heaven and earth are joined and divinity and humanity are reconciled. His life assures Christians that truth, though often contested, will ultimately prevail. Chapter 12. Hilary of Poitiers, the Athanasius of the West. In the lush region of Western Europe, during a time when the flicker of orthodoxy struggled against the winds of heresy, emerged Hilary of Poitiers, a steadfast luminary of the early Christian Church. His staunch defense of the Nicene faith against the encroaching Arianism earned him the moniker. The Athanasius of the West, Hilary's life and work were pivotal in shaping the theological contours of Western Christianity. Born into a pagan family in Poitiers, France around 310 AD, Hilary's journey to Christianity was an intellectual pilgrimage. He sought truth through philosophy, but ultimately found the answers to his existential quests in the Christian scriptures. Baptized in his adulthood, he quickly became renowned for his eloquence and was chosen as the bishop of his hometown around 350 AD. Hilary's episcopacy coincided with the turbulent times of Arianism spread in the Western Empire. The heresy, which denied the full divinity of Jesus Christ, was gaining ground and Hilary found himself in the heart of the theological storm. His unwavering commitment to the Nicene Creed and his fierce opposition to Arianism led to his exile to Phrygia by Emperor Constantius II, a supporter of the Arian position. His exile, however, only amplified his influence. During this period, he wrote his seminal work De Trinitat, On the Trinity, a rigorous exposition of the orthodox understanding of the Trinity. His theological writings provided a bulwark of doctrine for the Western Church, echoing the depth of Eastern theologians like Athanasius. De Trinitate not only defended the Nicene faith, but also explicated it, offering a profound and nuanced exploration of the nature of God as Trinity. He famously stated, It is not enough for us to know that God is. We must learn of what nature he is. Apart from his significant theological contributions, Hilary's approach to pastoral care was noteworthy. He was deeply concerned with the spiritual well-being of his flock and saw theological precision as directly linked to the health of the church. His writing style was characterized by clarity and pastoral warmth, making complex theological truths accessible to the faithful. One of the interesting aspects of Hilary's life is his role in the conversion of Martin of Tours, who would become one of the most revered saints in Western Christendom. Martin sought Hilary as a mentor and under his guidance laid the foundations of monastic life in the West. Hilary's advocacy for the Nicene faith was not without cost. He faced hostility and alienation from many of his episcopal colleagues. Nonetheless, he persevered and upon his return from exile in 361 AD, he continued his fight against Arianism in Gaul, eventually witnessing the waning of its influence. 
Hilary passed away in 367 AD, but his legacy endures as a testament to the power of theological conviction and the role of bishops as guardians of the faith. For students and believers, his life stands as an exemplar of intellectual rigor in service to the gospel, pastoral sensitivity, and unwavering commitment to truth. Hilary of Poitiers remains a vibrant voice, advocating that the understanding of God is foundational to Christian life and that the mystery of the Trinity is at the heart of the Christian encounter with God. His work and witness continue to illuminate the path of those who seek to articulate and live the central truths of the Christian faith. Chapter 13. Basil the Great Pillar of Orthodoxy and Compassion In the annals of Christian history, certain figures stand out for their theological acumen as well as their practical contributions to the life of the Church. Among these is Basil of Caesarea, known widely as Basil the Great. A luminary of the 4th century, Basil was not only a staunch defender of the Nicene faith, but also a pioneer in monasticism and social justice within the Christian community. Born around 330 AD into a family renowned for their piety and learning in Caesarea in modern-day Turkey, Basil would come to be recognized as one of the Cappadocian Fathers, a trio of theologians who were instrumental in formulating the doctrine of the Trinity. After a period of education that took him to Constantinople and Athens, where he formed a lifelong friendship with another great figure, Gregory of Nazianzus, Basil chose to retreat to a life of asceticism. Basil's retreat was not to last, for his gifts were too valuable to be cloistered away. In 370 AD, he was made Bishop of Caesarea. In this role, he was pivotal in opposing the Arian heresy, which was still influential despite the declarations of the Council of Nicaea. Basil's theological writings, particularly his work on the Holy Spirit, on the Holy Spirit, provided a clear and cogent argument for the full divinity of the Holy Spirit, which was a matter of contention even among those who opposed Arianism. His approach to theology was deeply pastoral. For Basil, understanding the nature of God was not an academic exercise, but a journey towards loving God more perfectly. He wrote, When you sit down to eat, pray. When you eat bread, do so thanking him for being so generous to you. If you drink wine, be mindful of him who has given it to you for your pleasure and as a relief in sickness. Interesting facts about Basil concern his practical application of Christian doctrine to social issues. He established a complex in Caesarea, known as the Basiliad, which was a marvel of the ancient world, a center for the care of the sick, the needy, and the training of ministers. This city of charity showcased the potential of Christian compassion when coupled with organization and resources. Basil also played a significant role in the development of monasticism. His rule for monastic life emphasized community life, prayer, and labor. It would influence Eastern monasticism, just as Benedict's rule would come to shape monasticism in the West. Quotes from Basil often reflect his concern for the practical side of Christian life. He admonished Christians, The bread that you do not use is the bread of the hungry. The garment hanging in your wardrobe is the garment of him who is naked. The shoes that you do not wear are the shoes of the one who is barefoot. The money that you keep locked away is the money of the poor. The acts of charity that you do not perform are so many injustices you commit. Basil died in 379 AD, but his impact on Christianity endures. His theological works contributed to the defeat of Arianism at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, which reaffirmed the Nicene faith. His social and monastic reforms have inspired countless Christians to see the care of the poor and the pursuit of a holy life as integral to the gospel. For modern readers, the life of Basil the Great is a stirring reminder that theology and charity are not mutually exclusive, but are indeed complementary. His life teaches that Christian doctrine is meant to be lived out with generosity and compassion, shaping not just the inner life of believers, but also their engagement with the wider world. Basil's witness challenges Christians to view the love of God and neighbor as the twin pillars upon which a meaningful Christian life is built. Chapter 14, Gregory of Nazianzus, The Theologian's Theologian. Amidst the tapestry of church history, woven with the threads of thought and devotion, Gregory of Nazianzus stands out as a figure of towering intellect and profound spiritual insight. Known endearingly as the theologian by the Orthodox Church, 
His eloquence and depth in explicating the mysteries of the faith have secured his place as one of the foremost early church fathers. Gregory was born in 329 AD in the town of Arianzus, near Nazianzus, in what is now Turkey. The son of a bishop, his pious upbringing laid the foundation for a life steeped in Christian doctrine and spirituality. His education, like that of his friend Basil the Great, took him to the cultural centers of Alexandria and Athens, where he became renowned for his scholarship and rhetoric. His writings, notably his five theological orations, are considered masterpieces of doctrinal clarity and eloquence. They were crucial in the final repudiation of Arianism, and they helped to crystallize the Church's teachings on the Trinity, specifically the concept of the consubstantiality of the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son. One of the most interesting facts about Gregory was his reluctant leadership. Despite his desire for contemplative life, he was twice drawn into important leadership roles. Initially, he assisted his aging father with his bishopric duties in Nazianzus, and later was coerced into assuming the bishopric of Constantinople. His tenure in Constantinople was marked by his eloquent defense of the Nicene Creed during the Second Ecumenical Council in 381 AD, which was instrumental in the council's reaffirmation of the creed established at Nicaea. Gregory's contributions to Christianity are not solely dogmatic, but also deeply existential. He poignantly articulated the Christian journey of divinization, the process by which Christians become more like God through grace. His homilies and poems reveal a man who wrestled with the realities of human frailty and the quest for divine love. He once wrote, To know oneself is the best way of. Knowing God, my God, when I contemplate you, I see the depth of my own nothingness and the greatness of your grandeur. Moreover, Gregory was ahead of his time in advocating for the importance of inner transformation alongside theological knowledge. He famously said, We are all a mixture. No one is steady enough to stay the same, even for a short time. His ascetic lifestyle and emphasis on inner purity were echoed in his pastoral advice. He championed a faith that was as much about the heart as the mind, saying, Let us purify ourselves to the bones, and let us love to be alone with our hearts, to speak to them, to investigate them. Gregory resigned from the bishopric of Constantinople in 381 AD, preferring the solace of private religious life until his death in 389 or 390 AD. His legacy, however, endured as his writings continued to shape Christian theology and practice. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD posthumously recognized him as one of the great teachers of the Church, a testament to the enduring influence of his thoughts and spiritual insight. For readers at the cusp of adulthood, Gregory's life stands as a beacon of the intellectual rigor and personal piety that defined the patristic era. His life exemplifies the harmony of reason and faith, inviting believers to an understanding of Christianity that is as rich in thought as it is in devotion. Gregory of Nazianzus remains a guiding star for those navigating the deep waters of Christian doctrine, encouraging a pursuit of God that is heartfelt and thoughtful in equal measure. Chapter 15, Gregory of Nyssa, Visionary of the Infinite In the galaxy of Christian thinkers, Gregory of Nyssa shines with a distinctive light. A thinker of profound depth, a mystical theologian, and an articulate advocate for the Christian faith, Gregory stands as a pivotal figure in the development of Christian thought. His life and work serve as a bridge between the biblical texts and the philosophical inquiries of his time, and his influence has spanned centuries, deeply affecting both Eastern and Western Christian traditions. Gregory was born around 335 AD into a family of saints, quite literally, as his brother Basil the Great and sister Macrina would also be revered as saints. He was the youngest in a large family, in the region of Cappadocia, part of modern-day Turkey. Gregory received a robust education, which sparked his lifelong love for philosophy and theology. Unlike his siblings, he did not initially pursue a career in the clergy, but was drawn into it through the influence of his brother Basil and his own inner calling. One of the most interesting facts about Gregory is his blend of mystical thought with rigorous intellectual inquiry. He saw no contradiction between the two, believing that it was through the mind that one could approach the mysteries of God. 
His works, especially the life of Moses, are as much spiritual meditations as they are theological treatises, blending Platonic philosophy with Christian doctrine in a synthesis that was both unique and groundbreaking. Gregory's most significant contribution to Christianity was his defense and development of the doctrine of the Trinity. In the face of the Arian controversy, which contested the divinity of Jesus Christ, Gregory, along with his brother Basil and friend Gregory of Nazianzus, articulated a vision of God as a perfect union of three distinct but consubstantial persons. His theological vision was marked by the concept of perichoresis, or interpenetration, which denotes the relational nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A champion of the concept of epectasis, Gregory viewed the spiritual life as an eternal progression toward God, who is infinite. He believed the soul's journey toward God was never-ending, as God's depths of beauty and truth could never be fully plumbed. He famously stated, The perfection of human nature consists perhaps in its very growth in goodness. Quotes from Gregory often reflect his contemplative nature and his dedication to the life of the Spirit. He believed deeply in the transformative power of Christianity, saying, The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. He encouraged believers to strive for personal holiness and to see the image of God reflected in everyone. He was also a strong advocate for social issues, speaking out against slavery and advocating for the poor. Gregory's theology was not just theoretical, but had practical implications for how Christians ought to live and treat others. After the death of his brother Basil, Gregory became a significant ecclesiastical figure, but he remained somewhat on the periphery of the political power struggles of the Church. His later years were dedicated to writing and reflection, leaving a legacy of works that would nourish the Church for generations to come. Gregory passed away around 395 AD. His writings, particularly on the soul and the resurrection, would go on to influence not just Christian thought, but also the development of Western philosophy. For those coming of age in a world where truth often seems relative, Gregory's pursuit of the infinite in the finite, the eternal in the temporal, offers a perspective that is at once challenging and uplifting. His vision of a Christian life is a journey that is always moving forward, always ascending and always deepening. A reminder that faith is not a static set of propositions, but a dynamic relationship with the God, who is love itself. Chapter 16, Epiphanius of Salamis, The Hammer of Heretics In the diverse landscape of early Christian thought, Epiphanius of Salamis emerges as a staunch defender of orthodoxy, an uncompromising figure known for his fervent opposition to heresy. His lifetime, spanning from around 310 to 403 AD, was one of religious contention, where the nascent Christian church was grappling with internal theological disputes and the challenge of defining a unified doctrine. Born before the establishment of Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire, Epiphanius lived through a time of significant transition. He is believed to have begun his monastic life in Palestine, eventually becoming a bishop in Cyprus. His early years in the monastic community deeply shaped his views on Christian practice and piety instilling in him a stringent asceticism and a commitment to the teachings of the Church as he understood them. One of Epiphanius's most enduring works is the Panarion, a comprehensive treatise against 80 heresies from the Gnostics to Originism. It serves not only as a vigorous defense of what he considered the apostolic faith, but also provides modern scholars with invaluable insights into the myriad beliefs and practices that existed in the early Church. What sets Epiphanius apart is his role as a heresiologist. His passion for safeguarding the purity of Christian doctrine was unparalleled. He was known to have a remarkable memory for scripture and an encyclopedic knowledge of the various movements within Christianity that he deemed heretical. His zealous efforts earned him the moniker Hammer of Heretics, reflecting his reputation for vigorously combating anything that deviated from his interpretation of orthodoxy. Epiphanius was known for his blunt and, at times, confrontational style. He famously crossed paths with the likes of St. John Chrysostom and St. Jerome, often clashing with them over theological and ecclesiastical matters. His dispute with Jerome over the latter's association with originist monks is one such example of his uncompromising stance on what he perceived as deviations from true Christian teaching. Despite his often contentious relations with other church leaders, 
Epiphanius was deeply respected for his austerity of life, his pastoral care, and his unwavering commitment to the church. He was known for saying, The first step to salvation is the fear of God, and the second is to live in the way that pleases him. His contributions to Christianity extended beyond polemics. He also engaged in pastoral and philanthropic work, ensuring that the teachings of the faith were coupled with acts of charity and care for the less fortunate. The legacy of Epiphanius, while marked by controversy, remains significant. His works provide a snapshot of the struggles within early Christianity to define itself against competing ideologies and his life an example of unwavering conviction in the face of heterodoxy. For students on the cusp of adulthood, the figure of Epiphanius of Salamis represents the complex reality of religious conviction. His life is a testament to the enduring human quest for truth and the challenges inherent in defining and defending one's beliefs. In the narrative of Epiphanius, we find a dialogue between faith and reason, zeal and knowledge, a dialogue that continues to resonate in the contemporary world. Chapter 17 John Chrysostom, the golden-mouthed preacher. In the annals of Christianity, few have earned a name so fitting as John Chrysostom, golden-mouthed, a title bestowed for his eloquent and fiery oratory. Born around 349 AD in Antioch, he rose to become one of the most prominent and influential preachers of his time, ultimately ascending to the episcopal throne of Constantinople. His sermons, which have endured in their eloquence and depth, reveal a pastor's heart, committed to moral reform and the spiritual health of his congregation. John's early life was marked by a pursuit of divine knowledge and asceticism. Under the tutelage of Libanius, a famed orator, he honed the skills that would later define his legacy. Rejecting a lucrative career in law, he chose instead the path of religious devotion, withdrawing into monastic seclusion for several years. These years shaped his spirituality, endowing him with a profound sense of divine mission that he carried into his public life. Upon his reluctant ordination as a priest, John embarked on a series of homilies that tackled both the exegesis of Scripture and the moral lapses of his time. His sermons were not reserved only for spiritual or doctrinal matters. They also addressed the social issues of the day, including the abuse of wealth and power. He famously admonished his congregants, both rich and poor, to live out the social implications of the gospel, saying, Do you wish to honor the body of Christ? Do not ignore him when he is naked. Do not pay him homage in the temple clad in silk, only then to neglect him outside where he is cold and ill-clad. As Archbishop of Constantinople, his reformist zeal intensified, often bringing him into conflict with the imperial authorities and the ecclesiastical establishment. His uncompromising stance on ecclesiastical and social reform, combined with his powerful preaching, earned him enemies among the political and religious elite. John's theology was notably practical and pastoral, emphasizing the transformation of Christian life through the application of Scripture. He was a master of Antiochian exegesis, focusing on the literal interpretation of the biblical text and its direct application to daily living. This approach made his teachings accessible and transformative, resonating with the common people while challenging the complacent and powerful. His series of sermons, the Paschal Homilies, remain among the most profound reflections on the resurrection in Christian literature. Moreover, his divine liturgy is still celebrated in Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholic churches, a testament to his lasting impact on Christian worship. Exiled from his see due to his vehement criticisms of the social injustices of the time, John Chrysostom's later life was marked by suffering and persecution. He died in 407 AD, during a forced march to a remote place of exile. However, his enduring legacy is one of passion for the gospel and commitment to the transformative power of preaching. For young minds embarking on the cusp of adulthood, John Chrysostom serves as an embodiment of the courage of conviction and the power of words to move society. His life and teachings illustrate the potential of faith to confront injustice and to inspire a life of integrity and compassion. Through the rich tapestry of his sermons and writings, we are reminded that the voice of one can indeed resonate through the ages, echoing the timeless call to live out the virtues of the gospel. Chapter 18 
Jerome scholar, ascetic, and translator. The life of Jerome, one of the most learned fathers of the Christian Church, is a journey through the intellectual and spiritual landscape of the late 4th and early 5th centuries. Born around 347 AD in the town of Striden in Dalmatia, modern-day Balkans, Jerome would become a central figure in the development of Western Christianity, particularly through his translation of the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate, which for centuries served as the definitive text for the Catholic Church. Educated in Rome, Jerome was baptized there, and his quest for knowledge led him to travel extensively, seeking out the wisdom of monastic teachers and hermits. He spent considerable time in Trier, Aquileia, Antioch, Constantinople and Alexandria, centers of learning and religious thought, immersing himself in scriptural studies, learning Hebrew, and engaging with the ascetic life. Jerome's penchant for asceticism found full expression during his sojourn in the Syrian desert, where he lived as a hermit for several years. This period was instrumental in shaping his rigorous spiritual discipline and his approach to Christian practice. It was also during this time that he endured the trials of illness and temptation, experiences that would later inform his writings on spiritual warfare and the ascetic life. Afterward, he settled in Bethlehem, where he established a monastery and a hospice, dedicating himself to scholarly pursuits, including his monumental work, the Vulgate. His translation process was meticulous and exhaustive, grounded in his belief that scripture was the foundation of Christian life. He famously stated, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, underscoring his commitment to making the Bible accessible to the Latin-speaking world. Jerome was a prolific writer, not just a translator. His letters and commentaries are rich with theological insight and practical wisdom. He corresponded with many leading figures of his day, including Augustine, advising and debating on various issues of doctrine and practice. He was, known for his wit, erudition, and at times a Serbic commentary, not shying away from controversy when he felt the integrity of the faith was at stake. His polemical works against various heresies, his biographies of Christian monks, and his theological treatises contributed significantly to the Christian literature of his time. He was a fierce defender of orthodoxy, engaging in significant debates on issues like the virginity of Mary and the nature of Christ. Despite his intellectual rigor, Jerome was also deeply committed to a life of Christian charity. He used his resources to establish a free hospital and hostels for pilgrims in Bethlehem, embodying his belief that faith must manifest in works of mercy and love. Jerome's legacy is vast and multifaceted. As a translator, he made an indelible impact on the course of Christianity by providing a version of the Bible that remained authoritative for over a millennium. As a theologian, his writings continue to be studied for their depth and clarity. As a monk and ascetic, his life is an example of the quest for personal holiness and dedication to the service of others. For young adults poised on the threshold of their own journeys, Jerome's life serves as an inspiration for the pursuit of knowledge and the importance of translating that knowledge into action. His story is a testament to the enduring power of education, the spiritual depth of a disciplined life, and the transformative potential of faith that is lived out with conviction and charity. Chapter 19, Augustine of Hippo, The Restless Heart of Faith. In the story of Christianity, few figures loom as large as Augustine of Hippo, a man whose works would come to define much of Western Christian theology. Born in 354 AD in Thagaste in present-day Algeria, Augustine's journey from wayward youth to bishop and theological giant mirrors the tumultuous path of a restless heart seeking repose in God. Augustine's early life was marked by intellectual curiosity and spiritual restlessness. Raised by a Christian mother, Monica, and a pagan father, Patricius, his spiritual and philosophical pursuits led him to Manichaeism, a dualistic religion claiming to provide simple answers to the problem of evil and the complexity of the universe. However, dissatisfaction with Manichaean teachings propelled him towards Neoplatonism and eventually back to the Christian faith. His conversion, famously chronicled in his autobiographical work Confessions, remains one of the most profound spiritual memoirs ever written. In it, he describes an intense inner struggle culminating in a deeply emotional conversion experience in a Milanese garden. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, he writes, 
capturing the essence of his spiritual odyssey. Augustine's intellectual contributions are vast and deeply embedded in Christian tradition. His works, Confessions and The City of God, are cornerstones of Christian literature. The former is an intimate exploration of sin, grace, and redemption, while the latter offers a vision of human history as a conflict between the City of God and the City of Man, reflecting on the nature of society, authority, and the Church. As the Bishop of Hippo Regius in North Africa, Augustine was also a pastor deeply concerned with the pastoral care and moral instruction of his flock. He engaged in extensive correspondence, providing advice and doctrinal clarification to individuals and churches alike. His sermons were practical, aimed at the daily lives of his listeners, full of warmth and insightful in their interpretation of Scripture. His theological insights were groundbreaking, particularly his doctrines of original sin and grace. Augustine argued that humanity is in need of divine grace for salvation, a radical dependence on God that underscored the necessity of humility and the rejection of pride. His debates with the British monk Pelagius over the nature of free will and grace had a lasting impact on the doctrine of salvation in the Christian Church. Augustine's thinking on the Trinity, the sacraments, the nature of the Church and Christian ethics have influenced countless theologians, from Thomas Aquinas to Martin Luther to modern thinkers. His willingness to engage with his own failings and doubts has made his writings relatable across the ages. Interesting facts about Augustine include his impact on secular philosophy, particularly through his ideas on time, memory and the self. His quote, The world is a book, and those who do not travel read only a page, although debated in its authenticity, reflects the breadth of his intellectual exploration. Augustine's legacy in Christianity is monumental. His life's work facilitated the transition of the Church's thought from the ancient to the medieval world, and his influence persists in theological discussions today. His was a life that encapsulated the human struggle for truth and meaning, and his teachings provide a guide for the spiritual and intellectual growth of believers. For students at the cusp of adulthood, Augustine's life exemplifies the journey of faith as one of questioning, seeking, and ultimately finding a home in a truth greater than oneself. His story encourages a rigorous pursuit of truth, combined with a humble acceptance of divine grace, teaching us that the quest for knowledge and the search for God are profoundly interconnected endeavors. Chapter 20. John Cassian, the Conduit of Desert Wisdom. John Cassian stands as a pivotal bridge between the early Christian hermits of the Egyptian desert and the burgeoning monastic communities of the Western Church. Born around 360 AD, Cassian's life unfolded during a time when the Christian monastic movement was taking definitive shape. His journey, from the ascetic deserts of Egypt to the shores of Western Europe, brought the spiritual wisdom of the East to the Latin-speaking world, profoundly influencing the development of Western monasticism. As a young man, Cassian, along with his companion Germanus, left his home to seek spiritual wisdom among the Desert Fathers, the early Christian hermits and monks of Egypt. For about two decades, he immersed himself in their ways, absorbing the ascetic practices and teachings that would form the bedrock of his later work. After leaving Egypt, he spent time in Constantinople, where he became a deacon under the tutelage of St. John Chrysostom, Cassian's most significant contribution came after he settled in the south of France, in the region of Provence. There, he founded two monasteries, one for men and one for women, and began to write the works that would earn him a place among the great transmitters of Christian spirituality. His most influential writings, the Institutes and the Conferences, are compilations of the wisdom he had gathered from the Desert Fathers, tailored for a Western monastic audience. The Institutes provided a rule of life for monastic communities, detailing the external organization and internal spiritual disciplines necessary for a monk's life. The conferences, however, delved deeper into the spiritual life, relaying conversations with the Desert Fathers on topics such as prayer, purity of heart, and the nature of God. His descriptions of the eight principal vices laid a foundation for what would later be known as the seven deadly sins, Cassian's work is remarkable not only for its content, but for its style. His writing is characterized by clarity and depth, making profound spiritual concepts accessible. 
he transmitted the idea of pure prayer or prayer of the heart to the Western Church, emphasizing its role in drawing the soul closer to God. Cassian famously taught that the kingdom of God is within you, urging a journey inward in search of divine intimacy. An interesting aspect of Cassian's biography is that, despite his enormous influence, he never achieved sainthood in the Western Church, partly due to his perceived semi-Pelagian stance, a view that human will plays a role in accepting God's grace, which was later deemed heretical. Nevertheless, his works were widely read and respected by many in the Church, including St. Benedict of Nursia, who recommended his writings to his monks. Cassian's writings, especially his thoughts on grace and free will, fostered ongoing theological discourse, contributing to the shaping of Christian views on human nature and divine intervention. His legacy lies in the way he synthesized the spiritual practices of the East with the intellectual traditions of the West, creating a unique and lasting monastic ethos. For grade 12 students, Cassian's life story serves as an example of the enduring quest for spiritual understanding and the sharing of wisdom across cultures. His biography encourages young adults to look beyond their immediate environment for wisdom, to synthesize diverse perspectives, and to apply their knowledge for the communal good. Cassian's journey from student to teacher exemplifies a lifelong commitment to learning and the value of mentoring others on their spiritual paths. Chapter 21, Cyril of Jerusalem, the Guide of the Catechumens. Cyril of Jerusalem was a guiding light in the formative years of the Christian Church, best known for his catechetical lectures, which have become a treasure trove for understanding the rituals and doctrines of early Christianity. Born around 313 AD, Cyril became the Bishop of Jerusalem, at a time when the city was still reeling from the aftershocks of the Arian controversy and the Church was seeking to affirm its teachings against heretical views. As Bishop, Cyril navigated the choppy waters of theological dispute with a pastor's heart. His primary concern was the instruction and spiritual formation of new Christians, known as catechumens, who were preparing for baptism. Cyril's series of lectures, delivered during Lent as a prelude to the baptismal rites at Easter, were meticulous expositions of Christian doctrine and practice. Cyril's catechetical lectures are a window into the Church's sacramental life in the 4th century, they cover the Articles of Faith as outlined in the Nicene Creed, explaining each in detail, and delve into the rites of Baptism, Chrismation, and the Eucharist. His teachings reveal a Church deeply sacramental in its understanding of salvation, viewing these rites as vital means of grace for the believer's journey towards God. One of Cyril's most enduring contributions is his explanation of the symbolism in the sacraments. For instance, he likened the renunciation of Satan during baptism to the ancient Israelites' crossing of the Red Sea, a passage from slavery to freedom, from the dominion of Pharaoh, symbolizing Satan, to the Promised Land, symbolizing the Kingdom of God. Cyril's approach to catechesis was both practical and mystical. He provided detailed instructions on how to live out the Christian faith, while also inviting the catechumens to experience the mystery of God's grace. He famously said, The Church is called Catholic because it extends over all the world, from one end of the earth to the other, and because it teaches universally and completely one and all the doctrines which ought to come to men's knowledge. Despite his dedication to the Church, Cyril's episcopacy was marked by controversy and exile. He was exiled from Jerusalem no less than three times due to disputes over his opposition to Arianism and the political machinations of the time. His resilience in the face of such adversity underscores the steadfast commitment he had to his flock and to the integrity of the faith. Interesting facts about Cyril include his reputed presence at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, which further affirmed the Nicene Creed and expanded the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. His work laid a foundation for the practices of liturgical worship and the systematic instruction of converts, which would be the mainstay of the Church for centuries. His life and work demonstrate the importance of a well-rounded education that not only informs, but also transforms. His belief in the power of ritual to convey and enact deep spiritual truths is a reminder of the importance of embodied practices in the learning process. Cyril's legacy in Christianity is characterized by his fervent defense of orthodox doctrine, his pastoral care for those entering the faith, and his profound impact on liturgical practices. 
His teachings continue to be a source of inspiration and guidance for those seeking to understand the foundational beliefs and sacramental life of the Christian Church. Chapter 22 Ambrose of Milan, the defender of the faith and spiritual mentor of saints. In the mosaic of early Christianity, Ambrose of Milan stands out as a resolute defender of church authority against secular powers, an architect of Christian worship, and a spiritual father whose guidance would nurture one of Christianity's most influential thinkers, Augustine of Hippo. Born into a Roman Christian family around 340 AD, Ambrose would ascend from the role of provincial governor to become one of the most esteemed bishops of the early church. Ambrose's ascent to the episcopate was as rapid as it was unexpected. While serving as the governor of Emilia Liguria in Milan, he was called upon to mediate a conflict between Arian and Nicene factions. His impartiality and eloquence led to an extraordinary demand by the people that he, though only a catechumen at the time, be made their bishop. He was baptized, ordained and consecrated as Bishop of Milan all within a week, a testament to the urgent need for a leader of his caliber. As bishop, Ambrose became known for his staunch stance against Arianism, advocating for the Nicene doctrine of the Trinity. He also championed the independence of the Church from the state, famously excommunicating the Roman Emperor Theodosius I for his role in the Massacre of Thessalonica, only absolving him after months of public penance. Ambrose's contributions to the liturgy of the Church were profound and enduring. He introduced antiphonal singing to enrich the worship experience, a practice where one side of the choir responds to the other, which has influenced Christian liturgy for centuries. He also composed hymns, many of which remain part of the Church's worship across various denominations today. Ambrose's sermons and writings were extensive, covering scripture, moral conduct, and the defense of orthodox doctrine. His theological works provided a sophisticated exposition of Christian beliefs, making a lasting impact on Western theology. He famously said, No duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks, emphasizing gratitude as a central Christian attitude. One of the most interesting facets of Ambrose's life is his relationship with Augustine of Hippo. Augustine, who had been seeking truth through various philosophies and religions, was profoundly influenced by Ambrose's preaching and personal guidance. This relationship culminated in Augustine's baptism at the hands of Ambrose, a pivotal moment in the history of Christianity. Despite his intellectual prowess, Ambrose was also known for his pastoral care. He gave away his wealth and lived a monastic life, setting an example for his flock. His care for the poor and for the theological and spiritual well-being of his congregation was a testament to his belief that the role of a bishop was not just administrative, but deeply pastoral. Ambrose's life is a compelling narrative of leadership, service, and intellectual engagement with faith. His ability to straddle the demands of church and state affairs, to be both a political and religious leader, offers a model of principled leadership that does not compromise on core values. His dedication to education, seen in his mentoring of Augustine and in his own writings, serves as an encouragement to lifelong learning and teaching. In the annals of Christian history, Ambrose of Milan is remembered as a pillar of the Church who shaped the Christian faith through his defense of orthodoxy, his liturgical innovations, and his spiritual mentorship. His legacy as a protector of the faith, a liturgist, and a spiritual guide endures in the practices and doctrines of Christianity to this day. Chapter 23 Gregory of Elvira the steadfast opponent of Arianism. In the chronicles of the early Christian Church, amidst the tumult of heretical challenges and the forging of doctrinal clarity, emerges the figure of Gregory of Elvira. His life, though shadowed by the paucity of detailed historical records, is illuminated by his unwavering commitment to combating Arianism, a theological stance that denied the full divinity of Christ and was a focal point of contention in the 4th century Church. Gregory was appointed as Bishop of Elvira in present-day Granada, Spain, around the year 355 AD. This was a period of intense theological conflict, with the Arian controversy threatening to rend the fabric of Christian unity. Gregory found himself at the heart of these disputes, and his episcopate was defined by his efforts to uphold the Nicene Creed, which affirmed the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father. Though the exact details of his life are scarce, 
what is known speaks to a bishop deeply engaged in the doctrinal battles of his time. Gregory was one of the signatories of the creed at the Council of Elvira, which set forth canons that would influence ecclesiastical discipline. His staunch opposition to Arianism led him to refuse communion with Arian bishops, and he is thought to have attended the Council of Rimini in 359, which was convened to discuss the Arian controversy. However, unlike many bishops who were swayed by Arian arguments or political pressure, Gregory remained steadfast in his opposition. Gregory's tenacity in the face of heresy was mirrored in his pastoral work. He was known for his asceticism, a lifestyle that would have served as an example to his flock, encouraging them toward a devout and disciplined Christian life. His approach to faith was marked by a rigorous adherence to orthodoxy, but also by a deep pastoral concern for the spiritual welfare of his diocese. While direct quotes from Gregory are not readily available, the impact of his efforts is reflected in the resolve of the Spanish Church to resist Arian influences. His legacy is that of a vigilant shepherd, watching over the integrity of Christian doctrine in his sphere of influence and, by extension, shaping the larger theological landscape of the Church. For students on the cusp of adulthood, Gregory of Elvira's story underscores the importance of standing firm in one's convictions and the impact such steadfastness can have on a community and beyond. His life is a testament to the belief that the defense of truth is paramount and that one individual's resolve can contribute to the shaping of collective understanding and belief. Gregory passed from this life into the next, around the year 392 AD, leaving behind a diocese fortified in the Nicene faith. Though he did not pen voluminous writings or leave a trove of sermons, Gregory of Elvira's biography speaks to the power of principled leadership and the enduring influence of a life dedicated to the preservation of truth in the Christian tradition. His role in the defense against Arianism helped to preserve the doctrinal purity that would be a cornerstone for generations of believers to come. Chapter 24, Diodore of Tarsus, the scriptural exegete and antagonist of Arianism. Diodore of Tarsus, a figure who stands at the crossroads of theological interpretation and ecclesiastical politics, played a pivotal role in shaping the direction of Christianity as it grappled with internal heresies and the quest for doctrinal purity. Born in the latter half of the 4th century, Diodore would become a formidable scholar and bishop, known for his deep commitment to the Nicene Creed and for laying the groundwork for what would later be known as the Antiochene School of Interpretation. As a young man, Diodore entered monastic life which was gaining popularity in the Eastern Roman Empire as a new expression of Christian devotion. His early experiences in the ascetic community near Antioch provided him with a profound understanding of Scripture and a love for exegetical theology. This love would become the bedrock of his life's work. His intellectual prowess was soon recognized, and Diodore became a presbyter in Antioch, a hub of Christian thought and debate. His expertise in biblical exegesis and his unflinching defense of the Nicene position against Arianism won him both respect and opposition. He championed a literal and historical approach to scripture, which would influence great theologians like John Chrysostom and Theodore of Mopsuestia, emphasizing the human agency in the Bible alongside the divine inspiration. Diodora's most significant contribution was perhaps his leadership in the theological battle against Arianism, he articulated a robust defense of the full divinity and humanity of Christ, countering the Arians, who diminished the divine nature of the Son. His work in this arena was critical in maintaining the integrity of the Nicene faith in the Eastern Church. Elevated to the bishopric of Tarsus, Diodore's influence extended through his pastoral care and teaching. He was known for his eloquence and his ability to make complex theological concepts accessible to the faithful, his sermons were imbued with practical applications, rooted in a deep understanding of Scripture. Though not many of Diodore's writings survive, his legacy is felt in the quotations preserved by later theologians and in the principles of interpretation he espoused, which emphasized the importance of context and the plain meaning of the text. One of his known positions was that the glory of God is the living man and the life of man is the vision of God highlighting the profound connection between human life and the divine purpose. Diodore's biography offers a portrait of a man who balanced scholarly pursuit with ecclesiastical duty. 
His life illustrates the enduring impact of thoughtful and careful interpretation of sacred texts and the importance of intellectual integrity in the face of doctrinal challenges. Diodor of Tarsus passed away at the end of the 4th century, but the reverberations of his theological and exegetical work continued to shape Christian doctrine and biblical scholarship for centuries. He remains a figure of inspiration for those who seek to understand the sacred texts while defending the core tenets of their faith against misinterpretation and error. His commitment to the Church and to the power of the written word as a means to know the divine stands as a lasting legacy of his life and work. Chapter 25 Patient of Barcelona, the pastor of souls and defender of the faith. Patient of Barcelona, a luminary in the 4th century church, was a beacon of pastoral care and doctrinal fidelity during a time of religious turmoil and societal transformation. His life and work, centered in the Iberian Peninsula, reflected the burgeoning theological and pastoral challenges of the age and the church's response to them. Patient's early life is shrouded in the mists of history, with little known about his upbringing and education. However, his emergence as the Bishop of Barcelona in the latter part of the 4th century marked the beginning of a significant episcopacy, during which he would become known for his eloquence, his staunch stance against heresy, and his gentle yet firm pastoral approach. One of the pressing issues Patien confronted was the Novationist controversy, which involved a sect that refused to readmit Christians who had lapsed during persecution unless they underwent rebaptism. Pakian's writings, especially his letters, reveal a man deeply concerned with the unity and sanctity of the Church. He advocated for the restoration of lapsed Christians through penance rather than rebaptism, emphasizing God's mercy and the efficacy of sincere repentance. His best known work, the treatise De Penitentia on Penitence, outlines his thoughts on the subject of repentance and penance. In it, he coins the memorable phrase, Christian is my name, Catholic is my surname, asserting the inseparable identity and universality of the Christian faith. His words were a clarion call for unity and orthodoxy in a time of division. Patience's pastoral heart is evident in his correspondence with the young nobleman Dexter, where he addresses the concerns of the day with fatherly wisdom. His letters, filled with practical advice and spiritual counsel, reveal a shepherd deeply invested in the welfare of his flock, both the elite and the common believer. Despite his confrontation with heresy, Patian was known for his moderation and compassion. He was revered for his ability to balance truth with love, conviction with compassion, and discipline with understanding. His approach to governance and doctrine eschewed harshness for reconciliation, yet without compromising the essential truths of Christianity. For students on the threshold of adulthood, Patient's life offers valuable lessons in leadership and integrity. He exemplifies the impact that thoughtful, principled guidance can have on a community, as well as the importance of articulating one's beliefs with clarity and charity. His commitment to the healing of the broken and the maintenance of church unity provides a powerful model for engaging with the complexities of human institutions and beliefs. Patient died around 391 AD, leaving behind a legacy characterized by his pastoral care, his defense of Christian orthodoxy, and his contributions to the spiritual literature of the Church. In a time when Christianity was still defining itself amidst a plethora of challenges, Pachian of Barcelona stands out as a figure who married the intellect and heart, theologically robust yet sensitive to the pastoral needs of his people. Through his life, one discerns the contours of a church grappling with its identity and finding its way forward through the wisdom and devotion of its leaders. Chapter 26, Cyril of Alexandria, the pillar of orthodoxy and champion of Theotokos. In the annals of church history, few figures have wielded as much influence on the course of Christian theology as Cyril of Alexandria. A bishop theologian and ardent defender of orthodox Christology, Cyril's legacy is inseparable from the shaping of doctrinal positions that are central to Christian beliefs to this day. Born around 376 AD into a family steeped in ecclesiastical leadership, Cyril was destined for a life interwoven with the affairs of the Church. His uncle, Theophilus, was the Patriarch of Alexandria, and it was under his guidance that Cyril received his theological training, which prepared him for a life of vigorous theological engagement and ecclesiastical leadership.
assuming the episcopal seat of Alexandria after his uncle's death in 412 AD, Cyril became a leading figure in the early 5th century church. His tenure as bishop was marked by fierce disputes with not only heretical movements, but also with political authorities and other ecclesiastical leaders. Cyril is most famously known for his role in the Christological debates of the early 5th century, particularly the controversy with the archdeacon Nestorius. Nestorius had posited a Christology that Cyril saw as effectively splitting Jesus into two persons, one divine and one human, rather than one person with both a divine and a human nature. Cyril's theological prowess was on full display as he argued for the unity of Christ's person, upholding the doctrine that Jesus was one person, fully God and fully man. It was at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD, a pivotal moment in church history, where Cyril's theological positions were vindicated. He championed the title Theotokos, God-bearer, for Mary, affirming that the one born of her was indeed God in the flesh. His defense of this title was not merely Marian devotion, but was crucial for maintaining the doctrine of the Incarnation that in Jesus, God had truly become human. Cyril's writings are voluminous and varied, including commentaries on the Pentateuch, the Major Prophets, the Gospels of Luke and John, and a host of treatises on doctrinal matters. His Five Tomes Against Nestorius and his Twelve Anathemas are particularly notable for their clarity and depth of insight into the mystery of Christ. One of his enduring quotes, I am amazed that there are some who are entirely in doubt as to whether the Holy Virgin should be called Theotokos or not, reflects his unyielding stance on the significance of Christ's divine maternity as a cornerstone of Christian faith. Cyril's contribution to Christianity cannot be overstated. He was a primary architect of the orthodox understanding of the nature of Christ, a doctrine that would have profound implications for all subsequent Christian thought and worship. His defense of the faith was not without cost. It involved him in numerous conflicts, including a significant clash with the Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius, and at times with imperial authorities. His work, particularly in the realm of Christology, has a unique relevance for students exploring the historical foundations of their faith. It reveals the depth of intellectual and spiritual struggle involved in discerning and articulating the core beliefs of Christianity. Cyril passed away in 444 AD, leaving a legacy as a formidable theologian and pastor. His passionate defense of doctrinal truth, combined with his commitment to the pastoral care of his flock, ensures his place as one of the most influential church fathers, whose impact reverberates through Christianity to this day. His life serves as an example of the power of conviction and the importance of rigor in theological reflection, teaching generations of believers the value of standing firm in the truths of their faith. Chapter 27, Vincent of Lerins, the Advocate of Orthodoxy in the Comminatorium. Nestled within the hallowed legacy of the Church Fathers, Vincent of Lerins stands as a beacon of orthodoxy and a guardian of Christian truth. Born in the early 5th century, Vincent was a man whose life was a tapestry of monastic devotion and theological inquiry, leaving a mark on Christianity with his enduring formula for orthodoxy. Quod ubiqui, quod semper, quod ab omnibus creditum est. What has been believed everywhere, always and by all. Vincent began his ecclesiastical journey as a soldier, but the tumult of martial life led him to seek solace in the monastic vocation. He entered the monastery at Lerins, an intellectual powerhouse of Christian thought, where the pursuit of pious living was inextricably linked with the quest for doctrinal purity. While the exact details of Vincent's life are shrouded in the mist of history, his literary legacy is crystallized in his seminal work, The Commonitorium. Written under the pseudonym Peregrinus around 434 AD, it was designed as a memorial of orthodoxy, a means to recall the true faith amid the rising tides of heresy. Vincent's commonitorium provided a criterion for distinguishing orthodoxy from heresy, famously encapsulating this in the Vincentian canon. True Christian teaching is that which has been believed everywhere, always and by all. This rule became a touchstone for subsequent generations, providing a benchmark for theological fidelity and a bulwark against innovation in essential doctrines. His writings are seasoned with insights and quotes that reveal his deep commitment to the continuity of faith. He insisted, It is necessary that on the essential points of doctrine 
all should speak in the same way, so that when one of those points is violated, all faith is violated. Such a statement underscores Vincent's concern for the preservation of apostolic teaching. Though less combative than some of his contemporaries, Vincent's contributions were no less pivotal. His moderate voice provided a path to consensus and unity, emphasizing the importance of community in discerning truth. He was not merely an academic. His monastic context meant that his theology was lived out in the daily rhythms of prayer and community life, making his faith deeply incarnational. Vincent's method for determining true doctrine was not only about preserving the past, but also about providing a dynamic means of engaging with new theological questions. He recognized that understanding of the faith deepens over time through what he called the progress of religion in the soul. He distinguished this organic development from the pernicious alteration of doctrine, highlighting that true development does not contradict prior understanding, but rather brings the church into a more full understanding of the apostolic deposit of faith. His contribution to Christianity was one of balance between the authority of tradition and the necessity of progress in doctrinal understanding. This balance is essential for a faith that claims both an ancient heritage and a contemporary presence. Vincent of Lerins passed away sometime after the completion of his commonitorium, but the impact of his work was timeless. In his commitment to doctrinal fidelity and his nuanced understanding of theological development, Vincent offered a model for engaging with the faith that has informed both the Church's self-understanding and its apologetics. His life and work offer a compelling narrative of a believer wholly committed to the truth, understanding that the message of the Gospel is not just a relic of the past, but a living reality that must be preserved, understood and articulated in every generation. Chapter 28. Leo the Great, the Pillar of Rome and Champion of Orthodoxy In the annals of Christianity, few have stood at the crossroads of church and empire as formidably as Pope Leo I, known to history as Leo the Great. His pontificate, which spanned from 440 to 461 AD, was marked by profound theological insight, deft political acumen, and an unwavering commitment to the pastoral care of his flock. Born into the social elite of Tuscany, Leo's rise to the See of Peter came during a period of great turmoil and transformation. As the Roman Empire frayed under the pressure of internal strife and external invasions, Leo became a bulwark of stability, not just for the Church, but for Rome itself. He is perhaps best remembered for his encounter with Attila the Hun in 452 AD, where, armed with nothing but his ecclesiastical authority and personal courage, he persuaded the fearsome warlord to turn back his armies from the gates of Rome, thus sparing the city from potential destruction. Theologically, Leo's contributions to Christianity are monumental. His letters and sermons, rich in doctrinal substance and clarity of thought, cemented his reputation as one of the great teachers of the faith. His Tome to Flavian, a letter sent to the Bishop of Constantinople in 449, articulated the dual nature of Christ in a manner that was pivotal to the Chalcedonian definition. His assertion that Christ is one person with two complete natures, divine and human, became a cornerstone of Orthodox Christology. Leo's eloquence and theological depth are encapsulated in his sermons, which are replete with memorable quotes. In a Christmas sermon, he famously stated, Christian, remember your dignity, and now that you share in God's own nature, do not return by sin to your former base condition. His words reflect his deep conviction of the transformative power of the Christian faith in the lives of believers. His sermons on the liturgical seasons and his robust ecclesiology also shaped the liturgical and hierarchical structure of the Church. Leo's vision of the Petrine authority, with the Bishop of Rome as the spiritual successor of St. Peter, reinforced Roman primacy and shaped the papacy's self-understanding for centuries to come. Leo was also an able administrator, asserting the Church's authority in matters of discipline and doctrine. His correspondence with bishops throughout the Empire reflects his role as a unifier and a teacher, providing guidance on issues ranging from the rebuke of heresy to the administration of sacraments. Under Leo's guidance, the Church did not simply survive a tumultuous period. It emerged stronger, with a clearer doctrinal identity 
and a reinvigorated sense of mission. Leo's leadership during the Council of Chalcedon in 451, which repudiated the heretical teachings of Eutyches, was pivotal. The Council's affirmation that Christ was to be acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, echoed Leo's tome and set a doctrinal standard that remains definitive for the vast majority of Christians. Despite his theological rigor, Leo was also deeply pastoral, constantly exhorting the faithful to live out the love of Christ. He cared for the poor and worked tirelessly to improve the social conditions of the downtrodden. His life was a testament to the belief that the authority of the church should be exercised in service to the world as a reflection of Christ's love and humility. Leo the Great died in 461 AD, but his legacy endures as one of the mightiest pillars upon which the church stands. In a time when the shadows seemed to lengthen over the Roman world, Leo was a light of orthodoxy and hope. He remains a beacon for leaders and laity alike, a reminder of the power of faith to navigate even the stormiest of seas. His life story is a narrative not just of survival, but of triumph, a testament to the profound impact one steadfast soul can have on the course of history and the preservation of the truth. Chapter 29. Afrahat the Persian Sage, the spiritual luminary of the East, Nestled within the rich tapestry of early Christian literature are the writings of a somewhat enigmatic figure known to us as Afrahat, the Persian sage. Afrahat, an early church father who lived during the tumultuous 4th century, shone as a beacon of wisdom and spiritual guidance during a time when Christianity was not yet fully established in the Persian Empire. His exact birth date remains a matter of scholarly debate, but what is certain is that his influence was felt deeply in the regions east of the Roman Empire, offering a unique perspective on Christian theology and praxis. Afrahat was a contemporary of the Arian controversy, which was causing divisions in the western parts of the Christian world. However, his works indicate that he was somewhat removed from these debates, focusing instead on living out the Christian faith amidst a Zoroastrian majority. His collection of 23 expositions known as the Demonstrations, is rich with pastoral insight and provides a window into the heart of a man deeply committed to the spiritual well-being of his readers. Each of Afrahat's demonstrations is dedicated to a particular virtue or aspect of Christian life, ranging from faith and love to fasting and humility. Through these writings, Afrahat emerges as a spiritual father, deeply concerned with the ethical formation of his flock, his emphasis on practical living and personal holiness over abstract theological discourse was perhaps a reflection of his context, where Christian communities needed guidance on how to survive and thrive in a non-Christian society. One of Afrahat's most enduring contributions was his argument for Christianity as the true faith, drawing upon the Hebrew scriptures to validate Christ as the Messiah. His approach was characterized by a respect for the Jewish roots of Christianity, which was significant given the Christian-Jewish tensions of his time. Afrahat often quoted from the Bible, stating at one point, For all the prophets prophesied about him alone and about his coming and about his cross. Such statements reveal his deep reverence for Scripture and his commitment to Christ-centered teaching. Interestingly, Afrahat is silent on many of the ecclesiastical issues that preoccupied his contemporaries in the West, there is little discussion of church hierarchy or sacramental theology in his works. This has led scholars to debate his relationship with the larger Christian world, with some suggesting he may have belonged to a semi-isolated Christian community. Despite this, his focus on scripture and asceticism contributed significantly to the spirituality of the Syrian Christian tradition. Afrahat's asceticism was not just a personal practice, but a recommended path for all Christians, he extolled the virtues of celibacy and fasting, not as ends in themselves, but as means to draw closer to God and live out the Christian calling more fully. His writings encourage Christians to be in the world, but not of it, to remain steadfast in faith amidst persecution, and to love not only friends, but also enemies, reflecting the teachings of Christ. An interesting fact about Afrahat is that while he is venerated as a saint in some traditions, he remains a relatively obscure figure in others. His feast day, observed on different dates in various Christian calendars,
commemorates a man who was both a product of his time and a timeless voice of spiritual wisdom. The legacy of Afrahat is found not only in the content of his demonstrations, but also in his method of engagement with the world. He modelled a way of being Christian that was earnest, scripturally grounded, and marked by practical love and service. In a world that was often hostile to Christian faith, Afrahat's writing served as a testament to the power of steadfast devotion and the transformative impact of living a Christ-centered life. As we close the chapter on Afrahat the Persian Sage, we are reminded of the diversity of voices that have shaped Christianity. His teachings continue to challenge believers to consider the practical implications of their faith and to live out the love of Christ in every aspect of their lives. His legacy endures as a sage voice calling across the centuries, reminding us that the pursuit of holiness and wisdom is as relevant today as it was in the sands and cities of his ancient Persian homeland. Chapter 30. John of Damascus, the last father and defender of the faith. In the tranquil confines of the Masaba Monastery, amidst the rugged deserts of the Holy Land, lived one of the final titans of the patristic age, John of Damascus. A polymath, theologian and hymnographer, John's influence cascaded through the ages, leaving an indelible mark on both Eastern and Western Christianity. John was born around 675, 676 AD, into a privileged Damascene family during a period of immense upheaval, as the Islamic caliphates were asserting their dominance over the Christian Byzantine territories. Yet within this backdrop of change, John's family maintained a Christian identity and secured for him a robust education that wove together the threads of Greek philosophy, theology, and science. This foundation primed him for his future role as a key figure in the Christian intellectual and spiritual tradition. His early career was as an administrator and financial officer for the Umayyad Caliphs, but a longing for a deeper spiritual life led him to resign and retreat to the Mar Saba Monastery. Here, John of Damascus embarked on his most impactful work, defending the use of icons during the iconoclastic controversy that rocked the Byzantine Empire. His treatises, collectively known as Three Treatises on the Divine Images, stand as a monumental work articulating the veneration not worship, of icons as windows to the divine, helping to restore their use within Christian worship after the end of the iconoclastic period. John's pen was a mighty weapon with which he fought for the preservation of traditional Christian doctrine. His comprehensive exposition of the Christian faith, the fountain of knowledge, was a beacon of orthodoxy, delineating the patristic consensus on Christian doctrine and effectively summarizing the theological debates that had animated the early church. This work became a cornerstone of Eastern Orthodox theological education, influencing Christian thought even into the present day. One of the most interesting facets of John's life was his ability to harmonize the wisdom of the ancient philosophers with Christian teaching, asserting that all truth is God's truth, no matter the source. His famous quote, the images of Christ and the Virgin Mother of God and of the other saints are to be had and to be kept, especially in churches, and that due honor and veneration are to be given them, encapsulates his staunch defense of holy images as a means to uplift the human mind to divine realities. John was also a sublime poet and hymnographer, with his contributions to the liturgical traditions of the church enduring to this day. The beauty of his hymns, such as those in the Octoechos, are not just in their theological depth, but also in their lyrical quality that elevates the soul in worship. His legacy is especially revered in the Eastern Orthodox Church, where he is honored as a saint, and his feast day is celebrated with great devotion. Moreover, John of Damascus was instrumental in synthesizing the works of the Church Fathers before him, presenting a coherent theological and philosophical worldview. His writings have served as a gateway to understanding the faith for countless generations of believers, showing an enduring relevance that transcends the centuries. In conclusion, John of Damascus stands as a towering figure at the crossroads of history, where the paths of the early church converged with the unfolding narrative of Islamic ascendancy. His efforts to articulate the faith in this context allowed for a continuity of Christian thought and practice that would have otherwise faced a significant threat. The final chapter of this collection honors a man whose life and work encapsulate the journey of Christianity through its formative centuries, 
and whose intellectual and spiritual legacy continues to illuminate the path of believers around the world. John of Damascus, the defender of icons and articulator of the faith, remains a beacon of wisdom, demonstrating the enduring power of Christian tradition and its capacity to speak to every age. Conclusion In the waning light of the patristic era, we have journeyed through the lives of thirty remarkable individuals, pillars of Christian thought and spirit. Each chapter has offered a glimpse into the enduring legacy of the Church Fathers, who were the architects of Christian doctrine, the defenders of the faith, and the pastoral hearts who shepherded a fledgling belief system into a defining force that has shaped the course of history. From the apostolic times of Clement of Rome to the theological depths of Augustine, from the deserts of Syria with Ephraim to the bustling streets of Constantinople with John Chrysostom, we have seen the mosaic of Christianity's early intellectual landscape. Their stories are woven with threads of courage, moments of divine insight and unwavering conviction in the face of heresy, persecution and the relentless tide of cultural change. These men were not just thinkers, they were believers who lived out their faith with an intensity that continues to inspire. They were not without flaws, for they were men of their time, yet their pursuit of truth, their commitment to the gospel, and their love for the church resonate with us across the centuries. Their writings, sermons, and hymns form a canon that still informs contemporary Christian thought. Their debates about the nature of Christ, the Trinity, and salvation laid the foundations upon which the global church now stands, and their lives, marked by a profound sense of divine calling, have left a legacy of spiritual passion and theological pursuit that continues to fuel the Church's mission in the world. This book has aimed to capture the essence of these early Christian leaders, not merely as historical figures, but as mentors in faith whose wisdom is still relevant. For the listeners who have walked with us through these biographies, the intention has been to provide not only information but also inspiration, a call to remember that the same spirit that empowered these Church Fathers is still at work today. As we conclude our exploration, may we carry forward the lessons of their lives. Let their dedication remind us of the enduring relevance of Christian faith, their intellectual rigor challenge us to think deeply about our beliefs, and their pastoral care inspire us to love and serve those around us. The journey through the lives of these spiritual giants concludes here, but the impact of their work is eternal a testament to the faith that they served and the God they loved. Theirs is a story that beckons us to continue the narrative of Christianity, to live out the truths they expounded, and to pass on the flame of faith that has been kindled by their witness. As the echoes of their teachings fade into the silence that marks the end of this book, may their lives continue to resonate in the hearts and minds of all who aspire to follow in the footsteps of such steadfast devotion to Christ.